Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Sheikh Ahmed Pira, Pastor Eric Pop, it is a great pleasure and a great honor for me to welcome you all to this gathering here tonight in a debate between our well-known, renowned Muslim scholar, Ahmed Tidat from South Africa, and the well-known Danish priest who has often attracted the eye of the media because of his sternness and his opinion and his bravery to speak it out, Pastor Eric Koch, in the, in the debate tonight here in Denmark, the first of its kind with the we can say with an open topic like this. And I'd like to, to, to greet you with the oldest greeting that we know, the peace greeting, peace be upon you, Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum. We will start tonight by listening to Sheikh Ahmed Didat giving his first his first ideas on tonight's topic and he will speak for approximately 50 minutes. After this, the word will be given to Mr. Eric Buck and he will have one full hour at his disposal in which he can give his answer to Sheikh Ahmed Tidat. After that, the word will again be given to Sheikh Ahmed Tidat and he will have another 10 minutes to give his rebuff on what Eric Buck may eventually have raised of issues that need a direct answer. So, I'm happy to give the word to Sheikh Ahmed Tidat. Mr. Chairman, respected pastor, and my dear brothers and sisters, Thomas Kalaib made a great mistake. Who is Thomas Carlyle? Thomas Carlyle happens to be one of the greatest thinkers of the past century, a European, a Britisher, most specifically a Scottish Presbyterian. In 1840, he delivered a series of talks in England under the theme Heroes and Hero Worship. Heroes and Hero Worship. And the first section of his talks was dedicated to the hero as God. And the gods that he discusses are the gods of the Scandinavians. The people in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, they had their gods before Christianity reached them. Like the gods of ancient Greece. Gods and goddesses who ate and drank, who wrangled and plotted, carried away the wives of other gods. Like the gods of the Hindus. The Scandinavians also had their own gods. In their mythology, in their fairy tales. Odin, Thors, Wardens. These are the gods of the ancient Scandinavians. He deals with that and heroes as military men, then as heroes as prophet, the hero prophet. He chooses, this Thomas Carlyle, he chose our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the holy prophet Muhammad, as his hero prophet. Amazing. A Christian, a Presbyterian, talking to his English Christian audience, 
and he does not present to them Moses as his hero prophet or David as his hero prophet or Solomon or Jesus but he chooses Muhammad as his hero prophet amazing situation he was about the first European to do some justice he tried to do some justice to our Nabi Karim he said that the lies which well-meaning zeal has heaped around this man are disgraceful to ourselves only that the people were trained to hate the man Muhammad and his religion. And he goes out of his way to prove to the contrary that this man is great, a mighty messenger of God. But he was wrong, I said, because at the start of his talk on the hero prophet, he makes known that in the history of the world, there will not again be any man ever so great whom his fellow men will take for a god. In other words, mankind has reached an intellectual level. Humanity as a whole, he assumed that they have reached an intellectual level where they will never acknowledge another human being as god. That is the mistake he made. That's what he said. In other words, we are very clever now. We are all are very clever. We won't accept another man as a god anymore. Never mind what the man does. The man comes to you and he says, look, I can fly in the air like a bird around the hall. Mm -hmm. And he comes back. Are you prepared to accept that man as your god? No. The man says, come, come, come. We go to the mortuary, to the hospital, and I call the people out of the dead, and they all come out. Will you accept the man as god? No. The man shows you in the palm of his hand and says, look, look, look like a TV. Look, you can see your wife, what she's doing at home. Can you see? Can you recognize her? He said, yes. Now, ex believe that I'm your God. He says, no, you're not my God. Why? He said, because when I look at you, me, for example, he said, you know, this man is about 70 years old. Now, man, what I do? I can read your mind. I can tell you the notes, the cor coroners that you got in your pocket, and I can give the numbers. Believe that I am your God. I say, no, sir. I don't know how you do all these things. But when I look at you, I can see that you are about 70 years old. Before 70, you were not here. You won't be here for another 70. That's definite. I don't know whether you last another seven. I don't know. If I had a knife, I can put it through you and kill you. I can strangle you. I can shoot you. You are not my God. You are not the creator of the heavens and the earth. How you do all these miraculous things, I don't know. I don't understand. That is the intellectual development of mankind today. That's what he said. But after he spoke this, that's 150 years ago in 1840, there are people on earth, they are worshipping men and monkeys, elephants and snakes. In America, Father Divine, an Afro-American, with the white man and the black man, we are worshipping as God. Sun Myung Moon, the Korean, there are people who are worshipping him as a God. They are worshipping the devil, Satan, worshipping cult in America. And in the world today, there are more polytheists in the world, people who are worshipping men and monkeys, elephants and snakes on God's good earth today, than the worshippers of the one true God. So, Carlyle was wrong. He assumed that we had reached that intellectual development where we will not accept another human being as God. But today, there are people who worship other human beings as gods. And the topic for this evening, of course, you know, is Jesus. Is Jesus God? And there are over one billion people on earth who say Jesus Christ is God incarnate. God Almighty who came down to earth as a man. And they? And they are the most knowledgeable people. People who land on the moon and they're making the Mars and Jupiter probes. They monitor the world like, like, like a, things in their hands, on their fingertips. They know what's going on in the world. But they still, despite all that, they still worship another human being as God. Now, what we want to establish is this. Before we confer divinity upon anybody, there is a rational question. Did the man claim to be God? Number one, we want to know whether the person made the claim. We have no right to say quizzling, you know the guy in Norway, 
who was selling his country to the Germans, Quisley. Heard the name? Quisley. That guy, let's say there is a Quisling cult in Norway. They say that the Quisling was the Messiah. He was the Messiah. And this cult grows and it overtakes Sweden and Denmark and the whole of Europe. They said, no, he was God. First question we have to ask is that this guy Quisling, did he claim to be God? Hitler! Some cult starts growing in Germany. New Nazis are once more on the war path. The races are on the war path again. And let's say it grows, the sickness grows. And 90 million Germans one day just said, Hitler was the Messiah. He was God incarnate. The sensible thing to do is to ask a simple question. Did Hitler say he was God? The answer is no. Did Quisling say he was God? The answer is no. Did Jesus say he is God? The answer is no. Simple, simple as that. Did the man claim divinity? If he claimed, then we have to analyze. What is God? What does it mean? It's not just a word. It means something. What does it mean? That this God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. We have to accept it. That God means we are talking about not just giving a God with a capital G or a God with a small g. It's, well, you know, he's very great, so we call him a God. That means nothing. God means we have to understand that the creator of the heavens and the earth, the unseen God of the universe, who is most merciful, who is most kind, these are his qualities in the Bible, in the Quran, that he is a spiritual being. Jesus said, God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in truth and in spirit, not in form, shape or size. Jesus is in form, shape and size. Qualities of God. What is God? So once we have established what we are looking for, I am putting forth to the pastor an offer. The source of your authority, the Christian authority, is the Holy Bible. Now if the pastor or anybody here in the audience can show me in his or her Bible a statement made by Jesus where he says, I am God, worship me. That's all. Just show it to me. In any Bible, Swedish, Danish, English, whatever, whatever version, Jehovah's Witness version, Roman Catholic version, Authorized King James version, Revised Standard version, any version of the Bible on earth. Just show me where Jesus says, I am God, where he says, worship me, and I am prepared to accept him as God, and I am prepared to worship him. I'm not speaking for you people. I have no right to speak on your behalf. I speak for myself. I am prepared to put my neck under the guillotine. You show me and chop off my head. You want to baptize me? Tonight, I'm prepared to go with you, wherever you take me. If there's a swimming pool around, I don't mind in this cold winter to go in and come out baptized. It is as easy as that. Easy. You can't be something easier than that. Just show me that Jesus says, I am God. He says, worship me. And believe me, my neck is safe. Believe me. Because I offered this to Pastor Stanley in Stockholm. And he failed. He said, while I'm talking, he said, I shall show it to you. I said, no, no, you have your time. Look, he's going to have an hour. So he went there and there. I said, no, no, you have your time. You'll have your hour. And the hour passed. So my last 10 minutes, I said, look, you haven't done it yet. I have put my neck on the block and you have not been able to chop it off. Because it's not there. The man never claimed divinity. Not only he didn't claim that he is not God, but he was so humble. Jesus Christ was so humble that a young Jew comes to him, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. A young Jew comes to him and says, I'm reading, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, teacher, in Hebrew, rabbi. Molly Sahib, 
Sheikh, Imam. And that's what he said. Good master. What good thing shall I do to, that I may have eternal life? That in the hereafter I'll have Jannah. What good thing must I do? That's the question. Instead of answering him, what he must do, Jesus says. And he, Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? What you calling me good for? There is none good except one that is God. Even goodness is not prepared to accept. Goodness belongs to God. God is good. He is all good. Me, I am a humble fellow, a humble teacher. Don't start pouring all these good words upon me. I don't deserve it. As a man, I admire the man. As a prophet, I admire the prophet. If he said that. You tell me, you say, no, Mr. D. Dot is the Billy Graham. Says, they have been advertising in Stockholm before I came. The, the Billy Graham of the Muslims and his Mr. Didat is Jimmy Swaggart of the Muslims and all kinds of nonsense. I said, look, please, man, leave all this thing out. You know, look, I am a humble fellow. You know, I have been talking, talking, and I talked myself into this position. I didn't go to Al-Azhar or to any university. I am not academically, not an educated man in, that we find in the audience here. I'm not out in any way like that. This is humility. We will accept from any man. Humbleness. But if the man is God, and he says, why call us army good, then it is not befitting. He is God, and he says, don't call me even good. What kind of a God is this? Because God is all good. Now, here is something. This, I'll leave it with the pastor. You know, easier reference. He does not have to start paging through Matthew, so and so, so. Uh, As I go along, I will hand it over, the references and the verses, so he does not have to open the Bible to verify. <laughs> now the absurdity of the claim that Jesus Christ is God. If he is God, if he is God, in inverted commas, then the birth of God is described in the Bible. If he's God. Birth of a man, we don't mind. But if he's God, then we take exception to what we read. God being born, so God was created from the seed of David. Can you imagine? God was created from the seed of David. And you read about David in the Bible. Stories which no Muslim will accept. His seed. God is the seed of, this is what the Bible says, concerning his son Jesus, I'm reading book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 3, I'll give it to the pastor just now. Concerning his son, God's son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, now this is what Paul is writing, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, it's not metaphorical, it means actually his seed, according to the flesh. Not metaphorical, literal. According to the flesh means literally he is the son of David. His seed passed on from man to man, man to man, till it reached his mother and he was so born. God being the son of David, it we say is making a mockery of God. His kingdom, God's kingdom extends over the heavens and the earth. Every religious man says so, believes so. But in the Bible, we are told, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verse 33, and he, Jesus, shall reign over the house of Jacob. The Jews, he's only going to rule over the Jews. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth, but his kingdom is restricted to the house of Jacob, Yaakov al -Islam. He had 12 sons and the 12 tribes of Israel, the Jews. His kingdom only extends over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. But we know, at the moment, the Jews are ruling in the seat of David. Who are sitting there? The Jews, not Jesus. But it was forever. It's cut off. Uh, it was supposed to be forever. <laughs> so what does ever mean in your language? You know what it means? Ever means ever. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> uh, here is another passage through. God Almighty 
according to the belief of the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims, he is all knowing, he knows everything. But we read in the scriptures, if he is God, we are taking exception to that he is God. If you say he is God, then we are now producing this evidence to say he is not God. But of that day, his knowledge, the knowledge of God is limited. If he is God, as a man, our knowledge is limited. We don't know when Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the last day, day of resurrection is going to take place. Nobody knows. But God ought to know. So if he is God, this is what the Bible says. But of that day, Jesus is saying, he says, of that day and that hour, no, no man, nobody knows. No, not the angels, even the angels don't know. Which are in heaven, neither the sun, I don't know. He's talking about himself as the sun. Neither the sun, but the father. Only Allah knows, only God knows. If he is God, then what pretense is this? He doesn't know. In knowledge, he's not like God. In power, he's not like God. What makes him God? We want to know. Everything that is being told to us is that he's not God. He's human, human, human. Not only that in his knowledge he's not like God, but in ordinary knowledge he's also deficient. Ordinary knowledge. Let me read it. Mark chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. It says, And on the morrow, next day, when they were come from Bethany, he, Jesus, was hungry. Can you imagine a hungry God? <laughs> no, please, look, no, this is what the book is saying. That he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, he saw a fig tree in the distance, full of leaves. Because he saw the leaves, he came, if happily, happily, he might find figs thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet, it was out of season. Why didn't he find figs? He sees the fig tree, is hungry, so he runs to it. Look, he didn't know that there were no figs on, as God he ought to have known. But look, he didn't know, maybe the hunger drove him, he ran up to it and he sees there's no leaves. And so no figs. Why? Luke tells us because it was out of season. Didn't Jesus know figs were out of season? Look, you don't have to be a god. You don't have to be a horticulturist to know these simple things. You come to my country in June, July and say you want leeches. Beautiful fruit, beautiful fruit. So we'll do it. So where you come from? He said Denmark. I said, oh, no leeches, you'll get Christmas time. Certain fruits, only certain time. Certain fruits, is in winter. It's summer now. There is summer at the moment. You don't get this mandarins. They say, no, that you get it in winter. You don't have to be a god. You don't have to be a farmer. You don't have to be a horticulturist. It's common knowledge. People ought to know what fruit is in season and what is not. This mighty messenger of God, I don't know how they put it, that he didn't even know that figs were out of season and he's expecting fruit. And when there's no fruit, what does he do? He gets angry with the tree and he curses that he should wither and die. Can you imagine? Is that tree is following his father's law, God Almighty. He's following the law of God. In season must bear fruit, out of season you don't bear fruit. Now he's expecting something to go against the nature of the tree. And because it doesn't go against his own nature, he curses it and the tree withers and dies. Next day, Peter coming forth, he says, Master, the tree which thou hast cursed has withered and died. For what? For following the law of God. Again, this is what they say about Jesus in the Bible, Matthew chapter 21 verse 18. That he's described as a hungry God. God in inverted from us. And this is what they say. I don't say that. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. A God, look, as a man we hunger and we thirst. But as a God he hungered, Matthew 21, 18. And again, and on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Chapter 11, verse 12 of Mark, Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. Now the quality of God are described in the Holy Quran, or more exactly, Jesus, his qualities are described. The Quran says, Mal Masihubnu Maryama illa Rasul. 
most certainly Messiah, translated Christ, Jesus. The son of Mary is no more than a messenger. قَدْ خَلَقْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ Many were the messengers that passed away before him. وَأُمُّهُ صِدِّيكَةِ And his mother was a virtuous woman, a saintly woman. This is the testimony in the Quran about Jesus and his mother. And his mother was a saintly woman. كَانَا يَأْكُلَانِ الطَّعَامِ And they both ate food. So what? We all eat food. No. This is to bring to your attention that there are people who are worshipping Mary, the mother of Jesus, as the mother of God, the Roman Catholic Church. Jesus, the mother of Mary is worshipped as the mother of God, as Goddess. And the Christian world worshipping Jesus as God. So Allah says they both add food. So what? Allah says, Unzur, see, kaifa nubayyinu lahumul ayate. See, I'm, I'm making my signs clear to you. The message plain to you. Summanzur, he says, have another look. Anna yufikun, how they have deviated from the path. Surah Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 78. In other words, Allah is telling us in a most diplomatic language that they add food. See, have another look. What? That if you eat food, you are dependent. God is independent. If you eat food, you have a call of nature. You run to the toilet. And if there's no toilet, you run to the rocks and the bushes around you. And the flies start buzzing around you. This is not the quality of God. Allah doesn't spell it out for you, but that's unzur. See, summanzur. Have another look. What? What are you talking about? God eating food. His mother, a goddess eating food and running to the toilet. Please, please, please. Don't do that. This is in Arabic. I don't know. It won't. Ah, these are all. It won't help. Again, the book says, John, chapter 19, verse 28, he saith, Jesus says, I thirst, I thirst. Look, a man thirst, I'm thirsting now. I take it, you don't mind. But God thirst, thirsting, it does not befit God. See, that's why we say, look, everything about him is human, human, human. And, again, if he is God, it says here, Matthew chapter 8, verse 24, he was asleep, God was asleep. And Luke chapter 8, 23, he fell asleep. And again, Mark chapter 4, verse 38, it says, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. God, God sleeping, he feels sleepy, drowsy. Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, in the Ayat al-Kursi, he says, neither slumber nor sleep overtaketh him. This is God. No sleep, no slumber. He doesn't get, get fatigued in guarding and cherishing his create, creation. Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul kayyum la ta'akhuzuhu sinatum wa Neither slumber nor sleep overtaketh him. This is my God. This is God. A, God. a person who feels sleepy can never be your God. He sleeps on a pillow or without a pillow is not your God. <laughs> then... This God, if he is God, in inverted commas, it tells us about his transport on earth. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, very meek, Jesus Christ, very meek, and sitting upon an ass in a donkey. Transport of God, a donkey, and he is very meek. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, donkey, sat thereon. John chapter 12 verse 14. He's very meek and he is using the donkey for his transport. The warring God, he's out for a war, for a fight. The strong arm method of God, in inverted commas, God. And when he went into the temple, Jesus, and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought. As a man, a righteous man, who was irritated by misbehavior of his people, understood. But as a God, his behavior is uncalled for. He's throwing people out and again in John chapter 2 verse 15 it says, and when he had made a scourge of small cords, he made a whip, 
And with this whip, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep, and the oxen, and poured out the changes, money, the money changes, and overthrew their tables. Now, this type of strong arm tactics, you know, belongs to the SS, not to a man of God. As a man of, as a human being, yes, but God doing such things, making a whip and going, beating people out of the temple. And the Bible describes this God in inverted commas. I said in inverted commas. I'm not saying so. It describes him. He says here, the quality of God. He says, God cannot be tempted. You can't tempt God. Make him to do things for you the way, the way you want it. So look, uh, if, you, if you don't do me this favor, you know I'm going to become a Hindu. You know, if you don't do me this favor, I will say you don't exist. You can't tempt God. So James chapter 1 verse 13 in the book, in the Holy Bible, it says, God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. He doesn't tempt anybody, nor can anybody tempt him. But in the book of Hebrews, again in the Bible, chapter 4 verse 15 we are told, but he, Jesus, was in all points tempted like as we are. Can you imagine? God doesn't tempt, we are told. Now, not only Jesus, he was Jesus, if he is God, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. We believe that all the prophets of God are sinless. But Jesus was tempted like anybody else. If he is God, he can't be.